I'll hand over to Caroline to start. Okay, right, excellent. So thanks everyone for uh, coming today to this workshop. Um, so the aim of the workshop is uh, to create an output, hopefully, not necessarily straight away, but eventually. Um, so Lydia and I are from the uh, STRIDE project, which stands for Socio-Technical Resilience in um, Software Engineering. And uh, a couple of our colleagues, Helen and Michelle, are also online. So they're from the STRIDE project as well. Helen's the PI. And what we're interested in is trying to understand um, uh, within the STRIDE project, what we're interested in is trying to understand um, what it is that makes uh, teams and people working in software engineering projects resilient. So rather than framing it in terms of uh, failure, you know, what helps people to uh, build robust software that, um, that works well. And one of the things that we have done as part of this is to partner with uh, the uh, Software Sustainability Institute, where I'm also the research director, um, because we're particularly interested in writing software for research. So how is it that people who write software for research, how do they um, manage in these particular situations? So, so these are one of the groups that we've been working with and hence doing this workshop here today. Uh, so the idea of the uh, workshop is to explore automation within uh, software engineering. So think about, so when we talk about um, automation, we're thinking about, uh, I'll, I'll come on to this in a second, but thinking about all of the tools that might help us within software engineering. We're also um, hopefully going to come out with, at, at the end of the workshop, a position paper. So what we want this to be, is going to be a short, short paper, not a long one, a short paper uh, that's basically looking at, you know, what we as a community think of in terms of automation and who the stakeholders are. So the aim of today's session is twofold. So on the one hand, we want to have this position paper where, you know, as a community, we, um, we're sort of framing what we think about this. But also, hopefully through this process, which Lida will take you through shortly, we're going to be um, exploring as individuals um, who the stakeholders are in the process as well. And, and so the, the aim of the workshop is to work through not just what we think about automation ourselves, but actually where we use automation within research software engineering, who are the stakeholders, who are the people who need to be consulted, who should we be including in that conversation? So thinking about it very much from a stakeholder engagement perspective as well. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll do those two, we'll, we'll fulfill those two aims during the workshop. Um, Lida, do you want to say a little bit more? Yeah, oh, oh, no, yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> Uh, right, so the way that we're going to do this is we've got some jam boards set up and we're going to get you to input uh, in response to some questions that I'm going to give you. And people online, you're going to be doing the same thing. The place that you'll find the uh, links for those is in the collaborative document. So hopefully you've all got access to that. Um, we can put a link in the chat if anyone hasn't. Uh, I believe there's a link to it off the main collaborative document you were all sent this morning. So don't worry, take time, get yourself set up. Yeah, sure. No, no problem. No problem. Uh, so, uh, and we're going to have a. Um, Caroline's going to talk to us about automation first, anyway. So, you know, you can, you've got a minute or two to get yourselves set up, um, and then I was going to do a little icebreaker to get us started as well. So, in the collaborative document, there's a link to a mentee. If you go to that, um, you will find a question there, which is. Or you can scan, if you're, for those of us in the room, you can scan the uh, QR code there. And the question is, how has your week been? It's something like that, it might be slightly different words. Um, and by that, I just mean literally the last seven days since, since this. Just give me one or two words on, on how it's been uh, that you feel comfortable sharing. So if everybody could do that, and then we'll get an idea of where we are in the room and online. So online people, hopefully you've got that link as well. I think Anita will put it in the chat for you too. Oh, that's it. That's how I worded it. In one or two words, how has the last week been for you? Imagine for anybody who's been involved in putting this event together, it's been busy, <laughs> it's 
stressful, delightful. So I think that number down there is telling me people have inputted. Um, oh, is it a bit slow? Ideal. <laughs> we may go through this same process of links being slow a few times, but we'll just get through it together. Right. Yeah, so I think we have got some responses there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and try and see them. Right. Busy but not productive. Not productive. Busy, stressful, stressful, eventful, busy, awesome. Puppy. Oh, someone's got a puppy. Brilliant. <laughs> stressful, exhausting and brilliant. Busy, sunny, okay-ish, wonderful, fun. So we've got a real mixed bag there, which is great because that's always how it is in life. Uh, but hopefully today won't feel too busy. Hopefully it will feel productive. Can't promise any puppies. Maybe it might be awesome. Anyway, so that's where we're all starting from. That's good to know. So, oh, I'll go back to this one. Okay, so we'll just proceed to Caroline. We'll talk to us about what is automation. Okay. And um, so, yes, actually, and I should have said earlier while I remember, um, if you want to take put your uh, name into the roll call of the notes document, um, what that means is that we will um, contact you afterwards, unless you ask us not to, in which case we won't, um, uh, so that we can involve you in um, reviewing the draft of the paper, basically, that we'll put together after the workshop. So pop your name and email address in there if you would like to be contacted, but obviously don't if you would prefer not to be. So what's automation? Um, so I think there's a bit of a spectrum of automation. Obviously, we've been using automation within uh, software engineering for a really long time. So if you think about, uh, so this is automation, think about how it helps you to program. So uh, an IDE, for example, will autocomplete, you know, some, you know, a phrase that you're writing. So, so that's an example of the sort of automation that we've been using for a while. But we now have... Um, the situation where, uh, terrifyingly, uh, some of the PGRs I work with, postgraduate researchers, are asking ChatGPT to write their code for them. So, uh, so, so things have moved on. Um, so we have this sort of spectrum of, of automation where, um, you know, every time, so every time we automate something, um, ho hopefully it makes our lives easier. Um, it might, in some uh, circumstances, remove errors from the process. So by automating a process, you have a bit more control over it. Um, in, in under some circumstances, um, so you may be able to so reduce human error. So this would be good, but then you know there, there comes a, a, a certain point where you introduce perhaps a lot of complexity and you reduce understanding in terms of in terms of the way that you're using the processes. So there's this balance between them. Um, so this is sort of what we're going to be talking about today. So so we could be um, talking about any forms of automation from this perspective. I would suggest that we think about um, new and future ones. So perhaps focusing less on, on IDE auto completion and more on what might happen in the future and how we need to think about that. Um, does anyone have any questions at this point? Is it the automation of the, the work that IDE would do or automating, say, software or the pipeline? Okay, so the question is, um, is it automation of the work that the RSE would do or automation of the um, pipeline? I guess it could be either of those. Yeah, so I think that would be, we'd be open to, to yeah. discussing either of those. Great. So this is the bit where we start to do the input. So uh, hopefully you should all have access to these links via the collaborative document. And I believe Anita is putting them in chat uh, for those of you who are joining online as well. Um, so if you want to go ahead and choose a Jamboard to go into, we've got four. So you will or you don't have one each. Uh, you'll be seeing what other people write. Um, and I'll open one up so you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> So 
So here is one. So hopefully this is all working for people online, uh, online as well. Um, so what you've got here is some questions. So this is thinking about a project, a research project that involves automation. Who might be impacted in a pro project that involves uh, automation and what might this impact be? So this is thinking about uh, people who are involved in the project, people who are apparently unconnected to the project, but may in some way be impacted. Also thinking about who's contributing to this project and what will they contribute? And what I'd like you to do is to um, enter them on these um, colored post-it notes, yellow for who will be impacted, green for what will this impact be, pink for who is contributing, orange for what will they contribute. And you can just right click on them and duplicate them and then input what you want. So what at the moment we're thinking about this quite generally, um, you could think about a specific project uh, that you may have been involved in or um, that, that, that you're aware of, or you could think about this more generally. Um, so uh, do you have any questions about how that works? And does anyone online have any questions? Put it in the chat and Anita, and Anita will let me know. You can do it collaboratively, um, that would be lovely. Um, what we'll do is, Think about how that works with the sound for, for online people. Online people, I believe there's enough of you that they may be able to talk on the, the call if we uh, meet, the, meet them. Um, yeah, hi. Hi, Anita. Lovely. Thanks so much for your patience. Okay, so if you start on those first, for the moment, leave the uh, blue stickies with numbers. I will explain what those are for later. Okay, right, away you go. How is everybody doing? Are we ready to stop for that question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Online people, are you okay if we move on to the next part? Great, brilliant, thank you. Okay, so does anybody want to say anything about anything that they've written on the jam boards and maybe we could try uh yeah could i could i ask yeah. a question about one of them actually um rob would you mind writing notes at the bottom of the notes document while people are talking because it'd be good to capture that as well thank you um so uh yeah so there's something down here about end users receiving more or less reliable tools i just wondered whether um, anybody wanted to expand on that, how it might be more reliable or less reliable? Any thoughts on that? Oh, oh my right. guess, lovely. Who have we got? Yeah, it's something that we just discussed, uh, like just before online. So uh, I think you can see two ways. Either you are really optimistic about these new uh, technologies in general, and you think that it will uh, be a good way for developers to make sure that their code is like as bug free as possible and to really help them to produce a uh, better, more robust code. Or you could uh, assume and be, be more pessimistic that it's something that we start to see a little bit maybe with ChatGPT is that some uh, developers will just blindly follow what the tool is saying, even though it's not always correct and will maybe just because of these produce tools that are low quality, just because they will start to uh, trust completely the, the technology without paying attention about what it's saying. What, wasn't that the problem with uh, Stack Overflow? So there is no change on that, I don't think. It's just blaming something else for the same thing. Uh, I, I would say that maybe one potential difference is that the, what you get from Stack Overflow, maybe you need a little bit more understanding of what it's saying to be able to implement the solution that it's proposing. For tools like uh, ChatGPT, for example, you can just copy paste and in some cases it will work, in some cases it won't. And so Stack Overflow, it, it may be copy pasting as well, but maybe you need where you need to know where you you will copy paste it, this kind of thing. So maybe you need a little bit more understanding about 
uh, what is happening to be able to use the suggestion. We've got, we've got a point, um, uh, comment in the room. I just wanted to say that kind of chat GPT has been kind of marketed for this purpose, whereas Stack Overflow, you're not actually meant to be copy and pasting from. You, you, you're not meant to be doing that and saying to your colleagues, just copy and paste literally from Stack Overflow. Whereas with chat GPT, that's, that's what they're trying. Well, lots of people are marketing it for that purpose. Got another in the room. Yeah, a, a similar point I was going to make, I think, which is along the lines of you go to Stack Overflow and you've probably asked a fairly narrow question. How do I do? Uh, well, you're not you're not asking a pretext question, of course. You're doing some search in Google about some problem you've got in Python or something and you get some response in Stack Overflow and it may be a couple of lines and, and then you, you use that as either inspiration or perhaps you're lucky and you can copy and paste it. In ChatGPT, you're saying, write me a function to do x or write me a write me a, a, a script to do lots of different things you know in one go and and so i think the the um yeah you're asking chat gpt to do a lot more in a single step and are you going back and checking that properly uh, just on that i think if there's another safeguard with stack overflow is usually unless you're the first one asking the question they are like hundreds of comments of like upload so the top you usually have some rubbish answers in the answers thread but you just read the first one which is a top voted one which has been like checked by a lot of people so there's quite a strong safeguard even sometimes it happens you copy an entire function from stack overflow because someone put it there and it's good but it's been checked by a lot of people well like when chat gpt gives you or uh, github copilot whoever gives you a, an entire function you don't know if it's copied from someone else repository as it is. So it's actually quite safe because it's been checked or if it's kind of a mesh of random bits of code is put together and you can't properly credit whoever did it. Well, like in your code, you can credit, oh, I took this big chunk of code from Stack Overflow. So I'm, just, I'm gonna put a link to the answer or whatever so I can at least credit whoever did it. Well, like ChatGPT, you have no idea where it's coming from. Yeah. Thanks very much. So I just wanted to make a broader point about automation and some of the comments in the Jamboard. So like my go-to thought as soon as someone says automation is automation of process. So like as you're committing into GitHub, you're automatically running tests or like kicking off actions in GitHub, for example. Um, and that's obviously very different from some kind of tool that was automatically uh, automating code writing. And so like in the Jamboard's someone had written like that the automation is obfuscating the process whereas my instinctive thought is that actually it massively opens up reproducibility um, and so um it's just an it's just an observation that like there's conflicting things in the in the boards so as the person who wrote obfuscate process i also wrote reduced toil right so um we i've been making this point um at work where we're trying to we are an engineering team of five people trying to run live infrastructure for more than 50 institutions we need automation we need that automatic running of tests when we commit to github and we build a lot of that into a python package where you can just be like deploy deploy things cluster x please and it happens and what i meant by obfuscate processes is that because we've had that all wrapped up in a package when i'm asked to deploy x thing to cluster y manually do i know how to do it there is a learning cost when you and there was a i'll see if i can dig out the paper but there is a very well cited paper um from a few um a few years ago around Automation absolutely helps us, reduces toil, gets us moving quickly, gives us more space to think creatively because we're not doing the boring stuff. But from a career development perspective, onboarding a new person and just be like, run this thing and it works. They don't actually learn anything. They don't add anything to their CV. They can't progress and move on. 
Um, and so we've been having discussions about and being really thoughtful about exactly which processes we are automating and where we are capturing the knowledge that is automating. And even can the tool we are using to automate be run in a, verb, a verbose manner for teaching the newcomers such that it's just, you have run X command. The things that are happening in the background are these things. And that actually helps the package also become self-documenting. Um, so that's kind of what I meant about obfuscating processes. Cool. Wait, here. It's a bit nervous about this microphone because I think if it goes near my collar, Hi. it's going to... Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that we we use heavy use of tools like Ansible, and I'm all, I always have I kind of agree with both what you're saying, and I think you've made an interesting point, which is I, I'm always thinking about what happens after I leave, uh, because there's a there's a real issue with when somebody leaves, then the whole system becomes unmaintainable, and somebody has to rebuild everything from scratch. So it's always in my mind that actually when I'm writing Ansible, for example, to make it exactly as you say, self-documenting, and, and as easy as possible for someone else to pick up and learn from, and so on. Great. Any, anyone? Great, lovely. Comment in the chat. Um, Hugo, do you want me to read it or would you like to speak it? Uh, well, I, I, I can say it's really quick. It's just that <laughs> before uh, we mentioned, like I, I said that it can be more or less really reliable and then discussion focused on the less real, reliable part. And I just wanted to emphasize that uh, the more reliable part, in my opinion, is linked to this kind of uh, continuous integration, better tools to check the code that will produce uh, some kind of like super static analysis, because at the moment it's still kind of limited in some languages, at least uh, this kind of thing. Like maybe the, the way to, to think about it is if you let the tool produce your code, then maybe it's a risk, but if you produce it yourself and then the tools come after, maybe it's better. I don't know if it's uh, a good way to think about it or not. Uh, yeah, curious to know what others are thinking. Right. Feels like we've all said what we want to. So I'm going to move us on to the next part of the exercise. I'm going <clears> to <throat> share my screen again. Right, so for the second part, I want to look at who you've identified, what you've put down on these notes. Um, and I should say, uh, the discussion just now was really interesting. If we could make sure that we've got that in some way captured. Uh, I know we're recording the audio, um, but just, uh, you know, any of these really valuable stuff, make sure that's on there in some way. So looking at what you've already got, we now want to think about who on all your post-it notes, which aren't really post-it notes, who has responsibility in any way in this project and who has some form of control? Uh, so what you need to do is delete the blue stickies one and two, and you'll see some little logos underneath them. Uh, if you just copy and paste those logos and attach them to the relevant notes. So hopefully that makes sense. If anyone's having any trouble, I'll, we can put one up and I'll show you how to do it, but it, it should hopefully work. So just the first two for now. Um, so Lida, yeah. what, would it be okay if people have started to identify, it, as part of this process, you start yeah. to identify further stakeholders to so just pop them in on post-it notes as well? Yes, yeah, keep, then, yeah absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That's fine. Yeah, yeah please, so, uh, if, you, if something so else has occurred to you, put it down. That's no problem at all. It's not a timed exam. We're just trying to get as much for us to look at later. So that's fine. Uh, okay, so hopefully that's working for everybody. If anyone's having any trouble with any of that, let me know. I'm also imagining... Oh, I've got five minutes there. I'll, um, I'll give you a few minutes and then we'll see if we need some more. Anyway, so how are we doing? I'm noticing fingers are stilling. Um, 
people need a bit more time? Do you feel like we're there? Uh, online people, let me know if you're okay. I'm not hearing any dissent, so I think we're probably satisfied there. So for the final part, we should have now on these jam boards, ideally, if this has gone the way I thought, we should have who is involved in some way, who might be impacted by some of these projects. Uh, oh, let's turn that off. Uh, so we should have um, <clears throat> we should have who is might be impacted, who might be involved in the project some way. Hopefully, we've now amongst those categories uh, identified who might have responsibility, who might have control. So now, what I want to think about is who to engage with. So this is the third sticky. So what we're looking for here is people who might be impacted but don't yet have any degree of control or buy-in in this. Uh, can you find those people on your jam boards? Are they there? So that's your final task. So again, you just delete the blue sticky number three and uh, copy and paste the logo and assign it to, to anyone that would fall under that. I'm beginning to sense, at least in the room, again, still fingers that we're, <laughs> that we're, people have, have, have uh, done what they, what they want. <laughs> so hopefully um, uh, people online as well, you're all right. Uh, let me know if not by the chat. Um, so hopefully what we've done now um, what we'll see when we, we look at these is that, um, oh, here's an interesting question. I'll get to this in a minute, Michelle, if that's okay. So hopefully what we've identified now is anybody who might be impacted but is otherwise not already involved. And these would be the obvious uh, targets. It's completely the wrong word, but these would be the obvious audience to engage with. Hi. Are we talking like ID or well, maybe even like more specifically the health and you, right? So yeah. Also, uh, this is, I think, like, kind of who has control and when responsibility kind of very different one thing. Yeah. Could you repeat the question for the one last one? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, yes, we do pass the mic and we'll uh, just do that and then we'll move sorry. to uh, Michelle. Um, yeah, I was just. It's just me being a bit confused about what type of automation because I found putting stickers or putting who is responsible, who has control is like completely different if we talk about chat GPT or if we talk about other types of like process automation sure. or like GitHub action or whatever. Yeah. Like that. Pass this over and then after uh, so you will go online. You said who has control is different, but I don't think it is. It was like who has control of GitHub, who controls the language server protocol that like does code completion in IDEs, who controls um, like uh, Copilot, who controls like infrastructure for GitHub, GitHub Actions, Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who controls the most popular code editor, um, Microsoft. Great, thank you. Um, and bringing in, I think this is connected, Michelle's question uh, to the, uh, from the online room, uh, in practice, how much control do project managers have? So what I think is really interesting that's coming out of all of this is that there are different sorts of control here and, and what do we really mean by control? So if we're thinking about who might who we, who we might want to engage with, may, what does it change if we say, um, if we think of control as buy-in? So who might we want to give buy-in? to a project involving some of this, um, rather than trying to think of control as the final say. Does that make it easier to assign some of those logos? I think uh, having worked as a project manager myself, I can say to Michelle, how much control do project managers have? Uh, <laughs> not a lot. Okay, so uh, we have now reached the end of the inputs, of the questions to, to prompt the inputs that, that I have. Um, but uh, I just wanted, to, we've got quite a bit of time left, actually. We've, we've done really well. Well done, Michelle Scott. Oh, yeah, hello. 
Michelle got a hand up. Yeah, uh, so it's just a, a question about what the um, in-person uh, room thought about the three questions, because the way I interpreted them, who has responsibility, who has control and who to engage with, meant that we could put the stickers only on the yellow who will be impacting and the pink stickers. But in the in-person room, there are several stickers on uh, on the green and the, the orange. So the things that will be impacted or the things that will be contributed. And I would like only to know what was the, the thinking behind it. Probably uh, there is some kind of interesting rationale for that. Um, and I would just like to elicit it. Did you want response from the room or from yes, me? Yeah, those who put uh, who put those stickers on the on the green and the orange things could uh, tell me what was their uh, thinking behind it, um, how, uh, attaching control to and responsibility to things um, rather than people. Uh, I would be interested in knowing. Okay, I think I, I'm struggling to hear you a little bit there, Michelle, but I think what you're asking is, did the in, people in the room have the same experience of finding that some of the stickers went more to one side than the other of that jam board? Oh, Not can we have quite. the microphone? So we, sorry, Rob. I think he's asking, forgive me, Michelle, if this is wrong. The other table I can see have put some, We on our table, we've only put stickers on the yellows and the pinks because it's the who will be in, um, who will be impacted and who is contributing. But on that team, they've put stickers on some of the impacts and uh, contributions. And I think he's asking um, why. Right. Because I exactly wanted to see that spread. I exactly wanted to see that happen because I because the assumption is that people designing and implementing and running the project are going to have responsibility and control and the people impacted aren't. And I'm precisely interested in seeing what happens if we actually imagine that people who are impacted could have some sort of control, could have some sort of responsibility, could have some sort of buy-in, and the other way around. It was exactly to uh, open that up to see how that how that fell out when we looked at it. Right. Oh, oh the impacts. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to cross the room. I think you will have put one on, like, who will be impacted and who is contributed? They've got an old boss. What? Why? <laughs> oh, fine. <laughs> I think I might have done um, this on one of them. And basically, my thought was this was like different roles in a team. For example, I think maybe we put it on unit testing, maybe or something like that. And it was like, okay, so somebody's going to be writing those codes, and the person who yeah. would be writing those codes is therefore responsible. Yeah. I I, I, I think sense. I think that's all fine and um, that's all good I think we can use all of that um once we've had a chance to go through it we'll have a look and for those of you that are finding this really interesting want to be involved in the follow-up um if you wanted to be able to then tell us more make sure you've put your details down on that collaborative document so we can follow up and also as well um in a minute I'll give a link to a survey and I'd really like some sort of feedback about how this has gone because this is very much an, an, an experiment in a way of trying to map out these stakeholders and, and think about this but I don't think it matters if we've if we've done it all slightly differently I think that's fine you've I got, love it actually you've got a hand up from Hugo yeah Hugo Thanks. Yeah, I think this, this question of different activities in the team is related to one problem I had. I think that the some of the categories that we created for stakeholders are too broad. For example, if we say developers, uh, sorry, sorry, like dev sorry, I'm just uh, I'm getting. If I could just ask for a little silence. Sorry, here you go. Carry on. Sorry. Should I start from the start then? Oh, or? Yes, okay. Uh, so. Uh, this question of different roles in the team is related to one issue that I had when we were trying to put the logos. Because, yeah. uh, for example, one of the categories that we created is developers. And I believe that developers at GitHub, for example, will likely have some kind of say or impact on some of the tools that are developed. But maybe an RSC at a research institute might have less uh, power to 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 decide 
the like future of these tools. So yeah, maybe one of the problems that we had is that the, the categories are just too generic and can encompass a lot of different, very different roles. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to see if I've, I've understood. Um, were you thinking about with the assigning the logos that they should be exclusive, that nobody could have more than one logo? Uh, not, not really. It's just that, for example, when we have the category developers, I'm not sure which developers we are talking about specifically. Are we talking about the developers of uh, like some kind of automation tools? Mm -hmm. For example, it could be engineers at GitHub or could be uh, like open source community members. Or are we talking about developers that may be more users of the tools? Okay, so I think um, what, I, what I'm hearing here is that uh, when doing this exercise on a specific project, it need to um, think about the prompt questions a little bit more and think about the, the, the categories that that throws things into and do it bespoke for a particular project that you're looking at because each project will, ha will have their own specificities. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add, um, in terms of the output paper, I think it is very important to very clear about what you mean by automation, because I, I was coming at it in terms of um, analysis, uh, automation, reproducible yeah. pipeline sort of thing, which we haven't really touched on. Yeah. But I guess there are similar challenges. So where, in, in terms of the oversight, you, if you don't want to lose the oversight, but you also want to get rid of the bugs that may come in from doing manual processes. So I'm coming at it from like biodiversity monitoring where we don't really have automated pipelines. There's a lot of people involved from the citizen scientists to the experts mm. verifying what species it was. And so there's concern in, in that setting to moving to an automated pipeline because you might lose that oversight. So yeah. I think, I think the, the really interesting thing for me is that sort of, if you automate things, do you lose, do you lose that sure. oversight? Sure. And what impact that has but yeah i think we need to be clear about yeah absolutely and one of the one of the one of the main things that may may come out is precisely that it's harder to do this on this more generic level like we've done it today this more general level um but it could but it, i'd be very interested to see what you say in the in the the, the survey about this about if i could ask you to think about what it would feel like to do this sort of workshop on a very specific project and how that would work. Um, great. Uh, Sorry, I just want, I just wanted to just go, just ask about this. So I, I, I know, I know what you mean. I understand what you're saying, and I agree that sort of clarifying what one means by automation is important. But I think so. Sarah was sort of saying, I, I'm just wondering whether, you know, welcome views from the room about this whether there is a difference between automating a process where you so you talk about obfuscating things and what what's the difference between that sort of automation and another form of automation say chat gpt so that was what's the difference between automating it sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. i think one thing that is probably causing this tension and that we don't know and we want to know specifically what we're talking about is that there's a lot of suspicious feeling about chat GTP. It's in the news for not always good reasons, been banned, like temporary ban, and I don't know the outcome of that in Italy. We've got no idea what it's been trained on. Whereas when we're automating processes, their processes we've developed and there's like you can um you can look up um concepts such as do nothing coding which is literally just a series of functions that says that just like prints to the terminal saying now you do this thing and the person does the thing manually and advances a script and you get and now you do this and then you can build that up into an automation script and you can be very confident and you can document it and you know that's exactly what you're doing with chat GTP, we're now getting into this realm of, and, and other things like GitHub Codepilot as well. When Codepilot drop, 
there was a lot of concern about licensing, whether it was being respected. I think there is a big question around further exploitation of volunteer labor if this thing is being trained on um, open source code, which it undoubtedly is. And I think that is why we want to know what automation are we talking about? Because I think we're all very happy saying that automating something that we have run, that we have developed to reduce our own toil, to help our own creative processes, good thing. But there's this morality issue with these things like chat GTP. And I'm not so naive to say that these kind of AI assisted tools are not the future. It quite clearly is. But like we need transparency and we need it to it, it it's gonna end up being like a capitalism discussion of the companies that control this these kind of models and what their motivations are and their transparency working. And I think that's why we're a little bit confused. Just to, um, well, we will come to you, but just to, to draw your attention to uh, the fact that we've got about five minutes left, just put the links for the survey and the, um, that's for the collaborative document again, uh, <laughs> which hopefully you should have by now, but otherwise carry on. Yes, I, I just would like to add one thing is, uh, we have to uh, look for what actually users need and whether user really need uh, needs that automation. Uh, and, you know, if, if they need it, for example, in my field, uh, somebody is like, okay, this is difficult to do for me as a clinician, as an engineer, can you provide me some automated software for that? And yes, I can do. But when we talk about chat GPT, it is, it is just uh, giving us uh, different ways of, you know, uh, here is uh, your thesis, you don't have to write it. So the, we don't know whether we need it or not. And a user can be a great idea provided, uh, like one of, the, one of these stickers is here, that a user who is using the software can be a great idea provider. They can tell what exactly they want, what are their needs and what to be automated and what not to be automated. I think, um, <clears throat> sorry, apart from that, apart from the user, it's um, us, well, our responsibility as developers, because who chooses to use chat GPT? Like some people might, some people won't, but at the end of the day, it's the developers who choose to go on it, use it, and whether to copy paste it, change it, or use it as a guidance, right? And this is where it becomes a morality issue rather than anything else. But going back to like career development, for example, as people coming into the industry, like quite recently, rather than being here for years and years, we are always looking for like new things to look into because Stack Overflow is full of like loads of jargon from our, like years. It's so hard sometimes to find the thing that you're looking for if it's niche and you read other people's code and you spend two days on it, but you can easily ask chat GPT saying like, I'm trying to use this algorithm to create a function for this. And it gives you it. Half the time it works, half the time it doesn't. It's your responsibility as a developer to debug it, alter it and document it the way you want. But there should be, rather than saying, oh, we shouldn't use these tools. Like we don't know where they're coming from. We should investigate what, where it's coming from. Yeah, but at the same time, we should also, as workplaces who provide these softwares and pipelines and whatever, all these automation, we should also set guidelines within ourselves for each like company or infrastructure or whatever. I do actually have a friend who has set up an ethics sort of consultancy who is now offering fair use term policy documents for chat GTP and similar automations, um, which I think speaks exactly to what you're saying. Thank you. I just want to add something really quickly, which is testing. So in either case, whether you're automating a pipeline or, or whatever, you need to make sure, well, in the case of obviously continuous integration, it is about unit tests. But in the case of pipelines you were mentioning, they need to be robustly tested. In the case of chat GPT, same thing goes, you know, even if you if you get a function created for you, you have to write unit tests for it. And you know that process, I suppose, is is the same no matter what you do. Thanks. Same. Yeah, I think we're at time, aren't we? We are at time. We are at time. Uh, it does feel like we've come to a natural pause. 
please just make sure that any that everything that, that you want to contribute is on those stickers and um, make sure that you signed up if you want to uh, be involved in the position paper um, and uh, yeah, if I could ask if you could give us some feedback on the structure of the workshop and what worked, what didn't, and I'd really would like to know about what didn't, because um, this is a real, you know, real sort of bit of an experiment. Um, that would be great. So thank you very much for your time. And also online people, thank you for bearing with us and uh, release you to your break. <laughs>